Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I like to discuss Labour's Employment Rights Bill. Polling suggests the public like it. The newspaper front pages suggest the Daily Mail hates it. Which is a pretty good place to start, I think. But first, for daily political commentary, please click the subscribe button so you don't miss out. So, Labour promised to unveil their huge employment rights bill in the first 100 days. Here it is, just ahead of that. It will take a while, of course, to find itself on the statute books because it's massive. There will still be plenty of scrutiny and potential changes to be made here and there, uh, though with Labour having such a strong majority that I don't think there'll be anything forced on the government. Gives Labour the chance to get back on the front foot, test out their new comms team, starts to control the media narrative again before the budget at the end of this month. And Labour have got a good start, you would say, because public opinion is already in favour of the main features of the bill, including the little compromises which took place more recently. Uh, more in common have done some polling, which finds strong support for the moves, all of the moves, especially amongst Labour voters, obviously. The most popular features appear to have been giving worker protections from unfair dismissal on day one, flexible working, the right to refuse to read work emails and texts outside their working hours. is another popular one, although... Um, that one's not going to be statutory. That is just going to be guidance now. Banning zero hours contracts, sick pay from day one of the illness are also very popular. Uh, there's even support for the idea of probation period. That's caused a bit of, that's been a bit of a bone of contention during the final drafting stages. And indeed the specific length of that probation can still be fine tuned during the, the sort of parliamentary processes. Essentially, Labour begin with a lot of public support for the plans, meaning they now need to make sure the media don't erode it. As I say, it's a big piece of legislation. It will take a lot of time to debate, report on and pass into law. I think they're talking about next summer. Then there'll be lots of opportunities for it to become newsworthy. And the Daily Mail is straight in attacking the idea. Today's headline, Business Fury at Labour's Revolution for Workers. Now, I thought... This is odd because I've seen business groups saying they're quite, you know, supportive of it. You can understand certain individuals who will go, no, I don't really like this. But before I get onto the specific objection, so where does this business fury come from? Because like I say, you know, I've, I've seen particularly the CBI being, uh, you know, praiseworthy of it. And as the TUC keep pointing out, and this has been my argument as well for years, like workers already have strong rights with good employers. So legislating for workers' rights, what it actually does is it helps good businesses avoid being undercut by bad businesses. The Mail have cited the Federation of Small Businesses. Now, yes, small businesses own you know, the small business owners are obviously more likely to have shakier business models and profit margins. So, yes, they're going to be the most concerned with major changes to the legislative landscape, and these changes are major. But other business groups, as I say, have praised the moves. Um, CBI, Chartered Management Institute, others. In fact, according to reports, there is only the Federation of Small Businesses has had any real objections at all. But one of the male's flagship objections just seems odd to me. It's on the front page. It said, it was a red tape nightmare that will kill jobs. Now, straight away, I thought, well, there's two curious things there. I thought, well, what is this red tape then? What, what is it? I read the article. You have to do that from time to time. And it mentioned this red tape in the article and didn't actually explain where it comes from or what it is. So I thought, OK, we'll just have to leave that one then. But as for killing jobs, it's like, <laughs> I thought, wouldn't the Tories like that? I'm not being facetious, by the way, because because right now there are more jobs in the UK than there are people to do them. That is, there are more jobs than there are working age people to do those jobs if you exclude those who are in full-time study or who have retired early. Like I keep saying, you're not going to persuade retired executives to come off the golf course in order to work in care homes. So in terms of those who could actually be available to work, I'm even including those with illnesses here, you know, because the Conservatives go, get off your arse, you lazy so. Even including people with illnesses, right? The, which actually you could argue could be dealt with in many cases if we had a functioning NHS. There are not enough. But the Tories don't want immigration to form part of the solution. So then you go, well, so if you can't fill the jobs, is there a problem with killing some jobs? After all, if there are more jobs than workers, then the workers have more choice, don't they? Which means they can demand better paying conditions. Tories hate that. So shouldn't they welcome a cull of jobs? Isn't that why they backed Brexit? 
I mean, I don't mind the Tories and Tory media being evil as such. I'd prefer it if they weren't. But could they at least make their evil sort of make sense? Then there are the objections that they passed on from the Federation of Small Businesses. I thought, OK, well, maybe these are well thought through. So it includes the fear that businesses will not be able to take on new people for fear of them being unsuitable and facing a tribunal for sacking them. But this isn't the case. The new legislation, I mean, OK, sure, <laughs> you're still not allowed to unfairly sack someone. So the solution to that is to not unfairly sack them. But the new legislation allows for a probation period where it would be easier to dismiss someone if they're unsuitable. You know, perhaps the red tape refers to that. Even given the probationary period, the employer would still need to write down their reasons for failing a worker's probation. Is that the red tape? You've got to write down your reasons? I mean, if they can't manage something as simple as that, perhaps they're not cut out for managing people anyway. Or maybe this quote is very old from the days when the policy was still in the embryonic stages. I don't know. But as these arguments have been published today, I'll work on the assumption they believe them to, to be relevant today. Basically, if an employer ends up with an unsuitable employee, let's think, even with this new legislation, let's think about the process here. It means they couldn't spot their unsuitability during their own selection process or up to nine months of probation observing them in work. I don't know how bad at management you have to be given all those safeguards to still cock up your recruitment. Now, sure, I get that small businesses find it harder to cover all skills. Like, you know, if you've got someone with a very small business, you know, the person running it, I mean, they may be great at running the business side of it or making and selling the products which allowed them to go into business in the first place. They may not be good at managing people. They may not have studied business management or anything. I get that. In which case, if there's a gap in the market to expand and you don't think you have the people management skills to do it, well, just let someone else who knows what they're doing do it then. I really don't see why millions of workers should suffer because a small number of small business owners lack the capacity to learn management skills. Because that seems to be the argument there. What we have here essentially is legislation which is going to make millions of the most vulnerable workers more secure in their employment. They will, there will also be extra rights for millions more workers, but as people keep pointing out, many employers already do much of it anyway. You know, there are already employers who are happy to implement working from home. My wife works from home. There are already employers who don't expect their workers to read emails or other messages outside working hours. There will be lots of measures in the legislation that some are going to look at and think, well, I already get that. Yes, because there are good employers who do this stuff anyway, because they understand that if you look after your workers, they will look after your business, which is why it's not really a leap in the dark. A lot of these measures are not a leap in the dark. A lot of businesses do them anyway and are successful. But this legislation, it's not just about giving a better deal to workers or even strengthening our economy in favour of good businesses. It's a huge political deal as well. This is one of Labour's flagship policies. And not just the result, but the perception of the result will play a huge part in how the public judge the success or otherwise of the Labour government. Now, as I say, it's going to be a long time before this becomes law. So there's lots of debate to be had about it. We know how the Tory media will want that debate to go. So Labour need to get on top of their messaging game. Not only reacting more quickly than they have been, not letting narratives become entrenched, but also heading off predictable lines before they take hold. You know, the decision, for example, today by Louise Haig, the Transport Secretary, to unveil her promotion of the bill at Dover. She mentioned the way P&O ferries suddenly sacked hundreds of British workers only to have the same jobs done more cheaply by foreign workers a few years ago. That was a good idea. The public were outraged at the time. They were so, I'll tell you how outraged the public were. Even the Conservative government had to pretend that they were upset, even though we found out later they knew it was going to happen anyway. But they, oh, this is disgraceful. We didn't think this was going to happen at all. Uh, there's some documents here, Minister, that says you knew about this before it happened. Oh, oh, yeah, I must have forgot. Oh, this is disgraceful. We're absolutely going to do something. Oh, we, we, we're, not going to, we're not going to take this line down. We're going to do something. Robust action. Their robust action took the form of, by the way, doing nothing other than handing them more government contracts. I would suggest Labour would do well to keep using specific examples of industrial abuse like that that the public would see as clearly wrong in order to keep promoting their legislation through what is going to be a lengthy passage through Parliament. 
And then, of course, a fairly lengthy implementation period in practice. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, you can join for memberships. Thanks for watching. And until next time, I'll see you later.